We are taught all our lives that our modern political systems are by and for the people. In order to justify taking us to war, then, our misleaders have to convince us that war is not a racket, as General Smedley Butler revealed, and is not for the benefit of the industrialists who sell the munitions, or the politicians in their back pocket, or the financiers that own them both, but in the interest of the average man or woman. In other words, they lie through their teeth. Why do they hate us? They hate our freedoms, our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech, our freedom to vote and assemble and disagree with each other. Such was the case with Afghanistan, which we were told was all about the hunt for Osama. I said a long time ago, one of our objectives is to smoke them out and get them running and bring them to justice. We're smoking them out, they're running, and now we're going to bring them to justice. Until it no longer was. So I, I don't know where he is. Nor do, you know, I, I just don't spend that much time on him, I'll be honest with you. Or Iraq, which was all about weapons of mass destruction. Intelligence gathered by this and other governments leaves no doubt that the Iraqi regime continues to possess and conceal some of the most lethal weapons ever devised. Until it no longer was. Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> By the time the original lie is exposed, it no longer matters why the war was started, only that it continues as long as it needs to. Suddenly the war in Afghanistan was all about women's rights, and the Iraq war was all about the purple fingers of democracy. Never mind that women in Kabul are worse off under NATO-installed UNICAL consultant Hamid Karzai than they were in the bad old days before Operation Cyclone. Never mind that Iraq is now a balkanized mess, divided along religious and ethnic lines and still rocked by bloody violence on a daily basis. The media spotlight has shifted to the next 24-7 distraction, and the public can go back to not being able to place these countries on a map, let alone care about their inhabitants. This is exactly the case with the NATO-led invasion of Libya in 2011, which once again we were told was about a heartfelt concern for the well-being of the Libyan people. The Libyan opposition and the Arab League appealed to the world to save lives in Libya. And so at my direction, America led an effort with our allies at the United Nations Security Council to pass a historic resolution that authorized a no-fly zone to stop the regime's attacks from the air and further authorized all necessary measures to protect the Libyan people. If this compassion for the plight of men and women in Libya was so heartfelt, why is it that you have heard nothing whatsoever about Libya in the last two years from the same politicians and talking heads who persuaded you that dropping bombs on the country was the only way to save it? Is it because the situation was resolved with the death of Gaddafi and the virtuous Western-backed freedom fighters have established a happy, prosperous, functioning society of peace and happiness? Of course not. Libya is on the way to becoming a terrorist outpost for possible future attacks on Europe. Uh, the prospect has been raised by Libya's former prime minister who came to power following the overthrow of the Gaddafi regime. Uh, he recently fled the country where rival militias run rampant and are in de facto control of the state. On a quiet Mediterranean night, you might think all is well in Tripoli until suddenly it's not. We filmed from our hotel balcony as two rival militia clashed. It turned into the worst fighting since the overthrow of Colonel Gaddafi. Libya's weak government has no control. The men with guns are a law unto themselves. The brigades who spearheaded the Libyan revolution now threaten to destroy it. Once again, the public was lied to just enough to convince them that war was necessary to maintain peace. And now that the real mission has been accomplished, and Libya's gold has been stolen, and its central bank has been established, and its AFRICOM-resisting leader has been killed, and it has been established as an operations base for NATO's al Qaeda mercenaries, they couldn't care less about the lives of the Libyan people. Earlier this week, Faraj Mufta, a spokesman for the largest Arab tribe in Libya, the Warfala tribe, Join me on the Corbett Report to discuss what life is like in Libya 
now that the NATO powers and their foreign jihadist assets have taken over the country. Every, every day you will hear uh, someone kidnapped, military officers kidnapped, uh, any civilian we will kidnap it, has been kidnapped by militia. Nobody knows uh, how this story was happening in Libya. Uh, from a few hours, now from three, four hours, just in Benghazi, our friend, civilian, he is a teacher for uh, university, at university, has been killed by terrorist groups in Benghazi. And they announced that they will kill anyone against them, from uh, police office, from uh, military, from uh, anyone who is who will, who is not a uh, member of Al-Qaeda or terrorist groups, uh, has will be will, will be killed. You know, this is the truth, and this is the way in Libya now, and this is the new stories now. Muslims Brotherhood members, terrorist groups in Egypt. Uh, since the revolution 30 June in, in Egypt by uh, General Sisi and his group against these groups, uh, they ran away to Libya and they start to make trouble against Egypt and against Libya, uh, from inside Libya, from Derna and Benghazi. And Musrata now, this is the main center for training terrorist groups. Derna as well, the main center for Al-Qaeda groups from all the world. There are those who have been trying to spread the word about this grim reality to anyone who will hear it, but unsurprisingly they have been ignored, shunned, and even threatened by the same US government that once mouthed its concern for Libya. A prime example of this phenomenon are James and Joanne Moriarty, two Americans working in Libya since 2007, who became first-hand eyewitnesses to the bloody war waged against the Libyan people in 2011, and the aftermath of cover-up perpetrated at the highest levels of political office. Um, Joanne and I were asked in um, May if we would go into Tripoli to head an NGO fact-finding commission. We agreed to do that. We went to Tripoli. We were there for 100 days. After the first few weeks there, we were trapped and could not get out of Tripoli. In the end, we were captured by al-Qaeda. We'd been put on their kill list because we had had the audacity to tell the Libyan people that they had the right to determine their own government. We were taken to the Al-Qaeda Torture Center, which was the Mahari Hotel. We were there a long time. So we had maybe 200 gigabytes of videos and, and photographs of what happened during that time with NATO. We had many, many personal interviews of people with their personal stories. This is why the government began to attack us, because they didn't want that put out, I am sure. They didn't tell us that exactly, but they, we tried to tell them uh, For more than more than two years, we contacted every politician in Washington D.C., Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, anybody that we could talk to that held any kind of position in security and homeland security and terrorism and uh, safety, et cetera. No one in Washington, D.C. would talk to us. We would get through their gatekeepers. Joanne was diligent six or eight hours every day trying to find someone so we could tell this government how wrong-footed we were in Libya, how we were supporting al-Qaeda, Muslim Brotherhood, and Sar al-Sharia. We knew about Benghazi happening six or eight weeks before it happened, couldn't tell anybody. We didn't know specifically that Chris Stevens was going to be killed, but we knew that there would be attacks on all the U.S. properties in Libya We told on people that they wouldn't listen. Nobody listened. No one listened. The treatment of the Moriarty's including their blacklisting in business circles in the United States and the numerous death threats they've received from government officials, is reprehensible. Those who are concerned about their situation in particular, and the real aftermath of the Libyan war in general, should see their website, LibyanWarTheTruth.com, and consult the DVD documenting their experiences for more of these details. But as long as we continue letting politicians lie about their concern for people around the world, whether it be the Egyptians in Tahrir Square who are now living through an era of chaos and upheaval while being virtually ignored by the politicians and commentators who pretended to care for them, or the Ukrainians who have just been signed into IMF debt slavery by the same forces that pretended to care about their plight, the same scenes of violence and misery will take place over and over again at the expense of the masses and for the benefit of the few at the very top. For citizens of the NATO countries who insist on blindly supporting the NATO war machine every time it kicks into action anywhere around the globe, and who buy into the rhetoric about helping people around the world and protecting interests abroad, ask yourself this. When was the last time that any war, 
anywhere amounted to anything more than a swindle for the benefit of the bankers in the war industry, or anything less than a bloodbath for the average man or woman in the target country. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.